So I'm going to continue on from where I was in the last lecture. So the, the purpose of the last lecture, we were trying to, to characterize generic rigidity in two-dimensional Euclidean space. And so basically what we spent most of the time on Wednesday talking about was that um, the Henneberg operations of zero and one extensions preserved generic rigidity. And then we talked a little bit towards the end, we defined um, two free type graphs. So we call it a graph is two free sparse if the number of edges in any subset, the number of edges in a graph induced by any subset X is at most two X minus three, as long as you have at least two vertices in your subset. And then the graph is two free tight. If as well as being two free sparse, it's also true that E is equal to two V minus three. And we did some small property, elementary properties of such graphs. I'll remind you of them when we need them. But basically the, the purpose of the first half of today's lecture is to finish what we were doing on Wednesday, which means what I want to do is show that every two free tight graph can be generated from K2, the smallest two free tight graph, by the zero and one extensions we were using last time. And then we'll use this to deduce our characterization of generic rigidity. Okay, so our first lemma, these two operations we're talking about in the two dimensional case, so zero extension adds a vertex of degree two and one extension adds a vertex of degree three. So we need to show that we always have such low degree vertices in a two free tight graph. So that's what, what this lemma does. So if I just assume sparsity, then already that's enough to, to guarantee that the, the minimum degree is less, strictly less than four. And if it's too free tight, and you're not just this sing, single edge graph here, then actually the minimum degree is either two or three. So exactly we have the, the right kind of degree vertices for what we want to do. So let, let's prove this lemma. It's hopefully very, very elementary. So for the first bit, we take a two free sparse graph and we want to prove the minimum degree is strictly less than four. So let's do a, a small contradiction argument. Suppose it's not, then we have two, um, actually, I guess I've taken the, the tight case here. So I, I've any two free sparse graph, you can extend to a two free tight graph, but if you prefer, just replace the word sparse here with tight, it doesn't matter. You, you could make a, make this argument work for sparse, but just for simplicity, let's say I put tight there, then two E equals four V minus six because E is two V minus three. But the handshaking lemma gives us this, that twice the number of edges is the sum of the degrees. Since I assumed every vertex had degree at least four, this is times the number of vertices by four as a minimum. So four V minus six should be bigger than four V, which is clearly a, a contradiction. So we must have some vertex of degree less than four. Secondly, we want to just check we can't have two lower degree vertex. So obviously in this two free tight graph, both vertices have degree one. So we have to use the fact that we have at least three vertices. And so let's see, see that. So suppose there exists a vertex whose degree is less than two, and let's call that vertex V, and then consider the graph G minus V. Since we're, we're two free tight, E equals two V minus three. So when we delete V, we lose some number of edges and we lose one vertex, but the number of edges we lose is either one or zero. So we lost from E, we subtract zero or we subtract one, but from this side, we subtract one from here. And so it's times by two, so we subtract two. So we turn our equality into an inequality and it's the way that violates the, the sparsity condition. So, um, I mean, this, is, this gives us this, which would be completely fine if this was your example, because we would get rid of this and have a single vertex left, which is two times one is two, minus two is zero, and there were no edges. But since there are at least two vertices on this side, it must satisfy the, the two free sparsity condition. And it doesn't because of this minus two. So we get a contradiction. Okay, so we must have vertices of degree two and or three in our um, two free tight graph. Okay, so now if you remember last time we started talking about, well, how do we reduce vertices of degree three? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a little bit of notation here that I'm gonna call G sub V superscript X, Y, 
that will be the graph you obtain from G by doing a one reduction at V, which means I delete the vertex V and I add the edge X, Y. So I delete one vertex, three edges and I add one edge. And the subscript tells me which vertex I delete and the superscript tells me which edge I add among the neighbors of V. So this is just some notation that will be helpful for us. Okay, so here's the, the combinatorial result. I call it the Henneberg construction. I, I guess the, the credit goes to um, Hilda Polachek Geringer, I guess, but um, it's so sometimes, I mean, until recently we thought Le Mans. Um, so what's the theorem say? It says that a graph is too free tight if and only if you can generate your graph from the complete graph on two vertices by a sequence of zero and one extensions. So I mentioned an exercise um, towards the end of the lecture on Wednesday saying that every graph you obtain by applying these operations preserves two free tightness. So if you start from K2 and you apply some zero extensions and some one extensions, you will be two free tight. So we talked about that direction as a, an exercise. So hopefully um, you're able to do that if you had a go. If you didn't, don't worry, it's, it's not too hard and it's not really um, relevant to the reduction argument we're gonna do. So now I'm gonna suppose that G is a, a two free tight graph and it has at least three vertices. So we just had a, a lemma that tells us it has minimum degree either two or three. Suppose that's a two, so then there exists a vertex of degree two. Delete it, the graph G minus V, it, it's not hard at all for you to convince yourself that is just two free tight. I've lost two edges and I've lost one vertex, but there's two times the number of vertices. So everything holds and every subgraph of G minus V is a subgraph of G. So they must all satisfy the, the sparsity condition. So this is, is hopefully easy. So we can reduce from having two options just to the case where the minimum degree is exactly free. And that's where we have to do a, an argument. Okay, so we're gonna consider the, the one reductions, the, the possible ways you can reduce a vertex V. But what I want you first to notice, suppose you have a vertex like this, it's so it's not true that I can just arbitrarily pick some edge among the neighbors. For example, the edge could be there. So if this was X and Y, then G, V, X, Y, the graph I get by the reduction has two copies of the edge X, Y, so it's, it's not good. It would violate the sparsity condition, but it's also not a, a simple graph, which is what we want. So here, both of these edges were bad, but there was one that was good. And so if you did delete V and add X, Z in this case, you'd result in a, a triangle, which is a smaller two free type graph. So here there was a reduction was possible, but not all of the free reductions were possible. And sometimes the reductions can be blocked for more subtle reasons than just the edge already existing. Okay. So, I mean, I sort of said that this is sort of implicit in what I've just been saying, but let's suppose our vertex of degree three has neighbors X, Y, and Z then it, it looks like this picture. And so what we have to think about first, and we talked about this a little bit last time, if we want to add the edge from X to Y, what can go wrong? So we know when we delete V, we delete three edges and one vertex. So we must add one to preserve the count E equals two V minus three. So the thing that can go wrong is the subgraph inequality can fail. And so, the way it fails, if you remember last time we defined a critical set. So X subset of V was critical. If I of X is equal to two X minus three, it can fail exactly if there is a critical set. So a critical set here, because when you add X, Y that would add a one here and give you a, a subgraph that the subgraph induced by X in the, the in G, V, X, Y would be a contradiction would be a counterexample to the, the sparsity condition. Okay, so I, I've skipped a step in, in some sense, the way I've drawn this picture of X, because we, ha we have to understand what, which vertices of X, Y, V, and Z can be in, in X and which ones can't. So it's clear that X and Y must be in X because we have to add the edge to the set, otherwise it will just be a, a subset uh, that would induce a subgraph that was already present in G and hence already be sparse. So, but we have to think about Z and about V for a moment. So obviously when we do the reduction, the problem doesn't include the vertex V because it's in a smaller graph that V is not part of. 
So X should be a subset of V minus V, but it also should be true that Z is not in X. So let's see why that's true. So suppose the, the block to me adding X, Y was a critical set X that contained X, Y, and Z. So it looks like this. But if that's true, then if we take the subset X union V, then this is equal to 2x union v minus 2 because I, I took x which was critical so I had this equality here and then I added one vertex so I added two to this side sorry two to this side and I added three edges so I added three to this side so I, I've gone up and got a so such an x cannot exist so if there's an x like this one that blocks us from doing a, a one reduction at v adding x x y then that set cannot contain z okay and this is good because it means we can then look at this one reduction the one that adds y z instead whereas if the, if an x like this could exist it could block both at the same time but now now we know that z's not in there that's good and it gives us multiple possible reductions we can do and in fact a third one round here as well. Okay so let's look at the second one so we look at the reduction adding yz instead of adding xy then just apply exactly the same argument we know there's a critical set y which contains y and z but does not contain x so we have a, a picture that looks like this one and so last time we talked about whether the unions and intersections of critical sets were critical, and hence this is exactly why, because now we know that if we can't reduce the vertex V, that we have these two critical sets, X and Y, so we need to worry about how they intersect. Okay? So suppose the intersection was at least two, that was the assumption we used in the lemma last time, to say that the if the two critical sets intersect in at least two vertices, then the union and intersection were both critical. So in particular for us, the union is critical. And now we make the same argument we just made to rule Z out. So since the union is critical, we can take I of X union Y union V, and we're adding three edges and one vertex. So we get make that bigger than twice X union Y union V minus three. So we get a contradiction again. So if both X and Y were blocking one reductions, and you had this condition, then we wouldn't have had a, a two free sparse graph. Okay, in fact, that's what I, I say here. So I've repeated that here. Okay. So, so what that means is that if X and Y both, if, neither, if one of them does not exist, we're done. So they both must exist. So it must be that this intersection condition fails and X intersect Y, which we know contains the vertex Y, must be exactly just the vertex y. So in this case, we have to move on to the, the third possible one reduction. So the, here's the, the, the words for that. So we look at gvxz, our third possible one reduction. So now again, just from before, we have a critical set z, doesn't contain the third neighbor. And from the argument we just said, if we look at the, the sets x and z, then they intersect in exactly one point, it'll be X. If we look at the sets Y and Z, they intersect in exactly one point, it'll be Z. So we know that X and Y intersect in Y, X and Z intersect in X, and Y and Z intersect in Z. So the, the intersection of all three is empty. Okay, so we have this um, kind of picture and now what we want to do is do the same thing again. What we, we want to say that if we take the set X union, Y union, Z and add V, then we get too many edges. We, we go by adding the, the three edges incident to, to V and the one vertex, we go up again. So we want to show that this thing, sorry, that this thing is a critical set. And so that's the, the claim, the next claim that this is critical and then I'd use this notation, which is basically just talking about edges between X, Y's and Z's. So it's the, the edge set of the, the graph induced by the union of X, Y and Z minus those that are inside X or inside Y or inside Z. Okay. So why is this thing critical? Okay, so 
what we need is, is a similar counting to what we did last time. So x is critical, so i of x is 2x minus 3. y is critical, so i of y is 2y minus 3. And z is critical, so i of z is 2z minus 3. And we have this extra term which just, just comes along for the ride. And then this should be uncontroversial, I think, that the number of edges you get from x, y, and z, plus the edges you would get from the, the these dx, y, z ones, is at most what's here. But the edges induced by x union y union z, this is a, a subgraph, x union y union z induces a subgraph of g, which is two free sparse. So we have this inequality. And then we can separate out, since we know exactly that x intersect y, x intersect z, and y intersect z are all singletons, and there's nothing in all three of them, we know that x union y union z is x plus y plus z minus 3. So we get this equality. And now we can just take the, the 2 times minus 3 and the minus 3 and split them up into the, the each of the three sets. So we have that 2x minus 3 plus 2y minus 3 plus 2z minus 3 plus this d of the triple is equal to the, the same thing without the is less than or equal to with the same thing without the, the d, which forces d to be zero, and it forces both the inequalities to be equalities, and hence we're, we're, we're through. So we've shown that since this one was a, an equality, that i of x union y union z must be equal to 2x union y union z minus 3, and hence x union y union z must be critical. Okay. So now I, we do exactly what I, I said. So the, the claim implies that when we add V, we add three edges, but only one times two to the vertex side. So we get a strict inequality and we contradict sparsity again. So what that means is that if all three of the one reductions, GVXY, GVXZ, and GVYZ, if all three of them were blocked, then we have a contradiction of sparsity. So at least one of them must not have been blocked. So at least one of the reductions preserves the two free tight condition and hence we, we are able to reduce to a smaller two free tight graph on a smaller number of vertices in this case and in the degree two case we did that much more easily earlier and hence we can get the the recursive construction theorem by induction on the number of vertices okay are there any questions about that I, i'm keeping an eye on the chat if anyone wants to so right there but feel free to shout out as well Okay, so here's just a, a small example. So I, it occurred to me that the examples I gave of two free tight graphs last time all had vertices of degree two. So firstly, here's an example, if you haven't already seen one, where the minimum degree is free. So in fact, that's a free regular graph. And so here's just a illustration of the, the sequence of operations. So you start from K2, I did a zero extension, then another zero extension adding this vertex. And then what did I do? I did a zero extension adding this vertex. And then I did a one extension, which deleted this edge and added the final vertex over here. So it'd be, you can pick whatever um, two free tight graph you like <coughs> and work through a, an example if you're unsure. So here's a, an exercise. So in the, the theorem, what I said was you start with K2 and you apply zeros and one extensions. But actually you can make the proof, um, I claim without much more work, which is the exercise, a little bit more general. So instead of starting from K2, you can take, suppose you have some two free tight graph G you want to generate. If it has a two free tight subgraph on more than two vertices, so obviously they all have single edges, so that's easy. But suppose your graph happens to contain k free free. Then what the exercise wants to show is that you can generate your whole graph by starting with k free free instead of starting from a single edge. So you can pick any two free tight subgraph of your two free tight graph and generate the whole thing just by taking that graph, completely leaving it alone, so not deleting any of the edges from it in the one extensions, but just working from it upwards. So this is a, a small generalization you might 
um, like to have a go at. Okay, so we're now at the point where we can characterize generic rigidity in two dimensions. So I, I mentioned her name before, but this, this is a, a theorem due to Hilda Polachek Geringer. Um, I often refer to it as Le Mans theorem because um, his historical reasons that we weren't aware of Polachek Geringer's work until much more recently. Um, what does the theorem say? It says for any graph G, the graph is minimally rigid, meaning so generically minimally rigid um, in R2, if and only if the graph is too free tight. So since we're in the generic case, we don't need to worry about the particular realization and we just um, understand rigidity purely by looking at two free tight graphs. Okay, so, so the proof, we, we've already talked about that minimally rigid graphs are too free tight, the Maxwell necessary direction. So we're just gonna prove the, the sufficiency. And basically from the last lecture and, and this, um, this lecture, it's just basically a, a very short proof putting together what we've done already. Okay, so we're gonna do induction on the number of vertices. So the smallest two free tight graph has two vertices, it's, it's K2. If um, let's say the vertices of K2 are X and Y, then we can just choose any locations PX and PY that are distinct. Then the row in the rigidity matrix will not be the zero row. So very clearly it has the rank one that you would want. So the base case, the rank of the rigidity matrix of K2 being one, which is two times two minus three is, is trivial. So we suppose G is two free tight on at least three vertices. Again, we know that this means there exists a vertex of degree two or three. And so now we can use the recursive construction to take our two free tight graph G, reduce a degree two or a degree three vertex by a zero reduction or a one reduction to a smaller two free tight graph G dash. So by the, the induction hypothesis, G dash is minimally rigid. And now we, we choose a, and we think, okay, we used a zero extension or a one extension. In the last lecture, we talked about why these operations preserve rank in the rigidity matrix, so they preserve minimal rigidity. And so the fact that zero and one extension preserve rigidity tells us that since G dash is minimally rigid, hence G will be minimally rigid and completes the proof. Okay, so that's the, the two-dimensional um, geringer Lemand theorem. Okay, William, yeah, I like that. That's like may catch on. Um, so I wanted to, to give a couple of reformulations of the theorem. So I said minimally rigid if and only if too free tight. So you can just as easily talk about independence in the, the rigidity matrix or R2 independence in the rigidity matroid and talk about a graph being independent if and only if it's sparse. And the rigidity case just happens to be the one where the independent is also full rank and the two free sparse is also two free tight. You can also throw edges in as well. So the second version is instead of having minimal rigidity, you can just talk about rigidity in two dimensions. So your graph is rigid if and only if it contains a spanning subgraph that's two free tight. So you have some subgraph H that's two free tight and spans a vertex set of G, that's a minimally rigid one. And so the rigid ones you just obtain from that by adding edges, however many you like to that. And you can also express things in, in matroid terms. So we talk about the, the two dimensional generic rigidity matroid. The sphere is giving us an isomorphism between that matroid and uh, a sparsity matroid. So I think in Mira's course, she's going to mention sparsity matroid. So I just threw this definition in at the end. So this is one particular sparsity matroid, the two free sparse matroid. So this is the matroid on some large complete graph in which a set of edges is independent if and only if the, the two free sparsity condition holds. So if and only if that set of edges, uh, if, if and only if for that set of edges, any subset F dash induces at most two V dash minus three edges, um, as long as F dash is not the empty set. Okay, so this, um, I mean, I haven't told you why this gives a, a nice matroid. So the proof of Le Mans whom you can think of as telling you it because it's the same as this particular row matroid, but you can check directly um, the, the axioms for a matroid 
hold for this thing. And in fact, you can change the, the two and the three if you like. So you have some amount of freedom to change these to other natural numbers, not complete freedom, but some amount of freedom, but I, I don't want to go into to that today. So this is where I'd intended to stop on Wednesday if I'd got as far as I, I planned. So I'm about half an hour behind, but it means it's a reasonable point if anyone has any questions before I move on to, to start what I had planned for today.